Know yourself, accept your faults, and work to overcome them. Hide nothing from yourself. Above all, don't lie to yourself. You can lie to the entire world if you like, but you must never lie to yourself. Fearless Warrior Spirit From time to time, during the dry and hot seasons of the year, wandering to Tunga monks passed through Ban Hue Sai, searching for secluded places to camp and meditate in solitude. The mountains and forests surrounding the village were areas of vast wilderness, forbidding and inhospitable. Wild animals roamed freely, and malevolent spirits were believed to reign supreme. The terrain remained a jungle, and fear kept it remote and sequestered. This made it an ideal place for wandering meditation monks to live and practice their ascetic way of life in solitude. Detached, reserved, and intent on renunciation, Dutunga monks hiked through the wilderness, often alone, along deserted trails. They sought secluded locations that offered body and mind a calm, quiet setting. A ridge, a cave, an overhanging cliff. Places suitable for striving to attain the end of all suffering. Living a life entirely out of doors, the Tutanga monk constantly put himself at the mercy of the elements and the vagaries of the weather. Living in harmony with his natural surroundings, a Tutanga monk's daily life featured nature's rich diversity. Rocks and trees, rivers and streams, tigers, snakes, elephants and bears. For his livelihood, he depended on collecting alms food in the small settlements that had sprung up at the jungle's edge. The Putai felt a common bond with the wandering ascetics and their fearless warrior spirit. Because of that, the monks easily found support for their lifestyle in Putai communities. Dapai's father was especially fond of the forest monks. True sons of the Buddha, he called them, with an appreciative smile. Energized by seeing them, he welcomed their arrival with childlike enthusiasm. In 1914, the arrival of Ajahn Zao Gantasilo, the renowned Tutunga master, transformed the spiritual landscape of Ban Hui Sai village life forever. Having come from afar, he and a small band of disciples simply wandered into the area on foot one day. They had been hiking for months, first crossing the Mekong River from Laos to Siam's Nakhon Panom province, then trekking over the eastern hills of Sakon Nakhon and down through the Pupan wilderness to reach Muktahan. Though he was 55 years old, Atan Sao walked entire days in the tropical heat, crossing the most arduous terrain with steady, effortless steps. When he and his group reached the vicinity of Ban Hui Sai village, the annual rains were just beginning. Cloud bursts and cooling showers were followed by lustrous sunshine illuminating the sky, while damp heat hugged the ground. Ajahn Sao knew that the changing climate beckoned him to search for a suitable site to spend the rains retreat, an annual three-month period of intensive meditation. Following the Buddha's instructions, Monks cease their wandering for the duration of the monsoon season to reside in one location, under the protection of a roof. Azan Sao was first spotted in the humid, misty dawn when he entered the sleepy village, leading a column of figures dressed in ochre-colored robes. Walking barefoot and with an alms bowl slung across one shoulder, the monks appeared ready to receive what generosity the inhabitants had to offer. Rice, pickled fish, bananas, smiles, and respectful bows. Stirred by the monks' serene, dignified appearance, the women, men, and children of the village scrambled to find some food to offer the Tumma monks, all the while yelling back and forth to one another in their excitement. By the time Ajahn Sao and his monks walked past Tapai's house, her whole family stood expectantly along the dirt track at the front, waiting to place morsels of food in the monks' bowls and hoping to accumulate special merit by their actions. Eager to discover the identity of the new arrivals, Tapai's father, along with a few friends, followed the monks back to their temporary campsite in the nearby foothills. Although Ajahn Sao was venerated as a supreme master throughout the region, Tasson and his friends had never met him face to face. Surprise turned into joy and excitement when they heard his name mentioned. Tapai's father resolved to have Ajahn Sao settle in the area, if only for the duration of the monsoon season. 
Well acquainted with the local terrain, fast flowing streams and winding rivers, overhanging caves and rocky outcrops, open savanna and dense jungle, Tasson acted as a guide to the venerable master, proposing various retreat sites for the coming rains. He was relieved, then overjoyed, when Ajahn Sao chose to enter the retreat at Banklang Cave, situated in a forested area scattered with flat, outspread sandstone boulders about an hour's walk from the village. Long before their introduction to Buddhism, the Pu Thai people upheld an ancient tradition of ritual spirit worship. They paid obeisance and performed sacrifices to benevolent ancestral spirits and to the guardian spirits of the forests. Ancestor worship was so ingrained in their character that the spirit shrine became a central feature of home life. Families presented daily oblations to placate long-dead forebears, actions believed to protect the family, the house, even the village, from unpleasant occurrences, including the unpleasant consequences of neglecting that sacred duty. If things went well, that meant the spirits were happy with the family's efforts. Neglecting the rituals displeased the spirits, which accounted for why things went wrong. Auspicious days were sought for the start of every endeavor, and propitiatory offerings were made to win the favor of local deities. The deities of earth and sky were not omitted. Due to an intimate association with rice and water, the Putai inherited an age-old saying, In eating, don't forget the rice field spirit, and never overlook the water spirit that brings us fish. So, while the center of each village featured the Buddhist temple, or Wat, spirit worship still dominated a major portion of the villagers' lives. For years, a Jan Sao wandered through the countryside, enlightening the locals about the virtues of moral behavior and explaining the causal consequences of their actions and beliefs. A Jan Sao did not deny the existence of spirits and deities, they abided everywhere, in everything. Forests, trees, mountains, caves, rivers, fields, earth, and sky. And he was tolerant of belief in non-physical existence. What he opposed was the belief that such entities were the causes, the instigators, of human pain and suffering, and the belief that bribes of sacrificial offerings could guard against adversity and misfortune. Local deities and ghosts were as much a part of Putai village life as the sun, the rain, and the morning fog, as inescapable as birth, life, and death. This Ajahn Sao did not refute, but he taught them that every non-physical being experienced the karmic consequences of its own actions. Each was the product of its own gamma, just like the villagers themselves. Worshipping these beings was, in effect, attributing to them a power that they did not possess. The essence of a Dan Sao's message was personal responsibility. Pleasure or pain, happiness or suffering, having or lacking, all are a result of an individual's past karmic deeds, combined with one's moral behavior in the present. Preparing a Dan Sao's encampment for the retreat required the construction of shelters to weather the monsoon rains, a single-room hut for each monk, and a central sala for meals and recitations of the monastic rules. Paths for walking meditation needed leveling, and latrines needed digging. With joy in his heart and a bounce in his step, Tapai's father quickly volunteered his services, cutting and sawing trees for stout posts, splitting and pressing bamboo for floors and walls, collecting and binding tall grasses for roof thatching. Paths were cleared, graded, and swept. Outdoor toilets were excavated and encircled with thatch. By the time Dasson and his friends completed the work, a small, orderly forest monastery had been crafted from the jungle wilderness. Spiritual transformation happened gradually for the Putai village. First one family, then another, took the leap of faith, faith in the protective power of the Lord Buddha, and faith in their own moral virtue. Many burned their spirit shrines and objects of ritual worship to ashes. Some were skeptical of Buddhism and hesitated. Who knew how the local deities would react? Might they not take revenge? Naturally frugal with speech, Ajahn Sao used his words sparingly to counter common fears and inculcate faith and virtue among the villagers. In talks that were direct and easy to understand, he taught them simple lessons. To instill faith, he encouraged them to replace the custom of sacrificial offerings with the practice of taking refuge in the Buddha, Tamma, and Sangha. To inculcate virtue, he encouraged them to observe the five moral precepts, 
refraining from killing, stealing, lying, committing adultery, and taking intoxicants. The villagers learned that by guarding their minds and actions with simple yet potent practices, and thus avoiding behavior harmful to themselves and others, they would acquire the means to protect themselves. So as to help them overcome and rid themselves of fear, Adan Sao taught them the protective power of meditation. First, he guided people in paying homage to the Buddha by chanting the Blessed One's virtues in unison. Once their hearts were calm and clear, he proceeded to allay their doubts and worries, speaking simply and concisely. Don't be afraid. As long as you meditate, focusing on Bhutto, 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 the spirits will never disturb you. Everyone falls ill at some point in life, but it's nonsense to think that sickness is caused by ghosts and spirits. Our bodies are constantly decaying and renewing themselves. The human body and illness go hand in hand. It's pointless to ask your dead relatives for help. Far better that you practice meditation and dedicate the merit of your actions to their spirits. Then you both will gain some benefit. As custom dictated, the villagers, especially devout Buddhists, reserved part of each lunar observance day for religious activities. They went to the monastery to offer food, help with the chores, listen to Tamma teachings, practice meditation, or undertake a combination of these activities. Dapai, now thirteen years old, often accompanied her parents on early morning hikes to the forest monastery at Banklang Cave. Being a girl, however, she was not allowed to mingle with the monks. So, when Atan Sao spoke to the lay people, Dabai sat far in the back of the sala, just within earshot of his soft, mellow voice. Seated behind the women and peering over her stepmother's shoulder, Dabai absorbed the atmosphere and the teachings. She, like all the villagers, had inherited the local cultural beliefs as a matter of course. Her worldview was colored by the same historical background. Yet, though she knew of the existence of spirits since early childhood, Dabai was not a superstitious person. She preferred instead to seek cause and effect relationships by means of common sense. So, while her family kept a small shrine honoring the spirits, Tapai's natural inclination was to embrace the Buddha and the truth of his teaching. Thus, from an early age, Tapai felt the lasting influence of a Dan Sao. She responded to his simple, down-to-earth manner, his even, serene temperament, and his noble and dignified appearance. He inspired a deep devotion in her, and left an indelible impression with his character, his words, his very presence. Even though she did not really make an effort to focus her mind in meditation as he instructed, Dabai sensed in her heart that Ajahn Sao had attained perfect peace. Soon, Dabai felt the subtle force of Ajahn Sao's personality pulling her in a new direction. She first felt this pull on one memorable occasion. She heard Ajahn Sao praise the womenfolk for their generous support of the monks. Their daily offerings of food and other necessities were not only beneficial to the monks, but they were also a blessing for their own futures as well. He then added, briefly and emphatically, that the virtue of generosity was nothing compared to the virtue of renunciation practiced by white-robed nuns meditating in the forest. This remark stirred Dabai at the core of her being. The nuns, said Ajahn Sao, were a fruitful field of merit for all living beings. With that pointed pronouncement, Ajahn Sao had planted a small seed in the young girl's heart that would one day grow into a majestic Bodhi tree.